Okay, so um, let's get started. Um, thank you all for coming, for joining us today, either from Corvallis or from whichever corner of the planet you are. <laughs> um, so for those of you who are not very familiar with me or the lecture series, let me introduce briefly. Um, I am Shao Zhenzhang, you can just call me Shao, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Oregon State University. Um, I've been serving as the organizer of the Anthropology Lecture Series since last year. This lecture series, um, also called the TANSAC Talks, features guest speakers from the OSU community, but also visitors from academic institutions or non-academic organizations in Oregon and beyond. Each term, we have a new roster of speakers invited to give presentations on cutting edge research, current events and other projects that resonate with the OSU anthropology community. Uh, but the whole lecture series is actually open to any OSU student, faculty or staff, as well as the general public. I mean, since before COVID-19. In response to the multiple crisis this year, the lecture series this term focuses on the intersecting topics of racial injustice, police accountability, and health disparity. The OSU news web portal issued a press release early last week that lists the schedule of all the talks this term. So I will share in the chat box of this Zoom meeting the web link to this press release for you to check and also my email address if you have questions about the lecture series. And just one uh, note for the students who uh, join, who attended lecture today for credits or for points in some classes, I would suggest you uh, rename yourself with your full name if you uh, do not have your full name shown so that we can have your full name uh, in the attendance um, report. And some other quick notes about time and the Zoom use. All the lectures are hosted from 12 to 12.50 on Fridays. 50 minutes, I know it's kind of a short time, but some students do have other classes at one. At each lecture, the speaker will make a presentation for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers. And especially since we have a big audience, I hope you can stay muted until your turn to raise a question to the speaker. And, but of course, you may also type down your question in the chat box in the question and answer session. And now I can help to read it out aloud to everybody. So now please allow me to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Nicole von Germerton, Professor of History and the Director of the School of History, Philosophy and the Religion at OSU. Professor Von Germerton received her PhD degree in history from the University of California, Berkeley in 2003. Since then, her study has been focused on cultural and historical awareness and the history of race, religion, gender, and sexuality in Spain and the Iberian empires. In addition to a long list of publications in edited volumes and the journals, she has also published the multiple books since 2006. To name a few, her first book titled The Black Blood Brothers is based on work in more than 20 Mexican archives and it describes the social and the religious life of Africans in Mexico using documentation from more than 60 Afro-Mexican brotherhoods. Her third book titled The Violent Delights, Violent Ends Sex, Honor, and the Witchcraft in Colonial Colombia came out with the University of New Mexico Press in 2013. Professor Von Germerton is currently working on a new project of her fifth book with the working title, Men with Lights, a history of an early North American police force. This book is expected to be published by the University of Nebraska Press in 2022. So we are so privileged to have an early tasting of her new book, given the great opportunity of her talk today, titled Race, Colonialism, and the Origins of Professional Law Enforcement in the Americas, Mexico City's Lantern Guards. So now let's welcome Professor Nicole von Germerton. 
Hi, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, thank you so much, Xiao. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. I hope I can um, do justice to this series, which is so uh, relevant and pertinent. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, yeah, and I, I'm honored to have this opportunity to discuss this book. And it's really nice to see such a good group of people um, uh, listening. I, I really, really appreciate that. I'm really flattered. So um, I'm just going to get going. And um, I hope my talk is only about 30 minutes. So then we can talk as much as everybody has time for afterwards. Um, and um, I'm definitely willing to, you know, talk about anything you like uh, after I give this formal talk. Um, but I'm going to stick to my my notes for the talk. <laughs> Um, so hopefully no, uh, not getting too off track in, the, in this time. Um, so I've been working on this project for around six years when I was finishing up uh, another um, book that came out in 2018. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to fix my screen here. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so I've been uh, researching in Mexico City and uh, writing here in Oregon. Of course, we're all um, kind of stuck in our homes, so that's what I've been doing. Um, so the topic of my book has certainly been on most of our minds in the last few years. Um, that is urban policing and how it connects to violence and racial injustice. So my goal in this book is to examine three themes. How the largest city um, in the Western Hemisphere at that time, and actually the second largest today, um, shaped its early law enforcement and justice system to carry out imperialist goals. Secondly, how poor or working class men implemented these goals as some of the first urban patrolmen in the Americas. And lastly, this book covers the events leading up to and during a revolution with global implications and examines how popular resistance to law enforcement over three decades intersected with political revolt. So for over, I'll set the scene. For over 300 years, European monarchs maintained a complex political system in a very populous region of America, areas that were highly valued for producing wealth to fuel international trade, war, and support the lavish spending of aristocrats in both church and state. Um, kings ruling from across the Atlantic Ocean knew that royal laws and courts adapted to on the ground circumstances provided a powerful backbone which might sustain their empire <clears throat> for a much longer duration um, than simple brute force. At its very core, imperialism demanded different legal statuses for a range of colonial subjects, including those who could claim European ancestry, also the tens of millions of descendants of indigenous peoples who continue to live in this geographic space, and hundreds of thousands of African descent people, uh, most of whose ancestors endured enslavement and the Middle Passage in previous centuries. This uh, empire formulated a biased court system in which certain colonial subjects were viewed as childlike, barbaric, and prone to vice, a poor work ethic, and extreme life-destroying substance abuse. Fearing accelerating and diverse urban population growth, and repeating a uh, European narrative that um, growth in city numbers caused a vague danger, the most powerful royal officials and the capital city government created street patrols made up of working class men who acted as foot soldiers in a system that incarcerated, flogged, and imposed uh, convict, labor, convict labor sentences on urban residents who violated the European vision of civilized behavior, justifying this new form of law enforcement as helping to prevent crimes such as murder and robbery. This kind of sounds familiar, but this is talking about Mexico City in the 1700s. So um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna cover um, four overlapping themes around which all of the action in my book converges. Um, there's a lot of other stuff in my book too, but this is what I'm gonna cover today. So Mexico City is background, the night watchman, the, the patrolman that I'm talking about, the theme of light and enlightenment and resistance and revolution. So um, as the capital of the Viceroyalty of New Spain, in 1800, Mexico City had roughly 130,000 residents, maybe more um, uh, difficult to count, of course, in those days. And while 130,000 people seems tiny by today's standards, this, side, this population is larger than every single city added together, every major city in the United States at that time added together is in this one city. Um, this population ranked Mexico City just below the much larger European cities of Paris and London and a few other large cities 
in Europe, <clears throat> about fifth or sixth in uh, the Western world at that time. Um, and of course now Mexico City is kind of in the same place globally uh, in terms of it being a huge population center. So for the first, uh, talking about the population of the city, for the first time in its history, starting in the 18th century, people who claimed Spanish uh, descent to census takers represented about half of the residents of this place that had been the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan before 1521. The remaining residents descended from African indigenous peoples with a handful of um, Filipinos and other Asians in the city. While some of the elite enjoyed a lifestyle rivaling that of European aristocrats and a few thousand others made a good income for their families as lawyers, notaries, business managers, and merchants, probably close to 90% of the people in Mexico City at this time lived a hand-to-mouth existence of difficult physical labor. Some common jobs for the poor included um, working on the endless construction projects of a beautifying and growing city, uh, carrying water or other burdens or in other low pain artisanal, artisanal workshops. All non-elite women worked, um, of course elite women did too in, in, within the household. Um, uh, poor women worked washing clothes, domestic service, uh, cooking for other people, selling food and alcohol in street markets, weaving cloth and making clothes. And if you look at um, the corner of this map, the left hand corner near where the um, cardinal directions are, you can see a square uh, building with like six or so patios. Um, that is the um, new tobacco factory, which was um, <clears throat> created around this time. And it had about 7,000 employees, which if you think about it in that time is incredible, men and women. <clears throat> so Mexico City was a court city. Um, sorry, just working on changing my slides there. Mexico City was a court city where the Spanish Viceroy sat and ruled over an enormous kingdom uh, extending from California to Panama, and Mexico City um, also had some jurisdiction over the Philippines and the Caribbean. <clears throat> uh, Mexico City offered its residents many diversions at night. There were theaters, bullfights, dances, uh, bathhouses, sometimes co-ed bathhouses, private casinos, cafes, parks for leisurely promenades, and uh, frequent street festivals and parades. <clears throat> And this, as I said before, this was an era of city beautification. So the idea was um, beautiful, organized, clean city that's portrayed in this, um, you know, somewhat fant fantastical image. Uh, of course, um, the most popular activity, which pretty much, oh, sorry, um, I just wanted to show actually also, so this is the main plaza of Mexico City. Um, and includes the cathedral and the viceregal palace, not, not a very realistic representation. And then here we actually have that map that I showed you before, but a close up of this main plaza. You can see on the left, the cathedral, a uh, very large building, and then um, the plaza in front of it that has uh, like a garden and that oval is in front of the viceregal palace. So below then there's an image of um, how it looks roughly today and just behind the flag for Mexico, the nation of Mexico is the Viceregal Palace. So that's 1700s versus today. So um, <clears throat> the, as I was saying then, the most popular activity which pretty much anyone could afford was uh, drinking pulque, which is a native drink made from the fermented juice of the maguey plant at very simple, uh, cheap taverns called puquerias. And here's an artistic impression of a puqueria. So according to the historian Toshki Gare, the puquerias had no floor, <clears throat> just the flattened earth. These taverns usually only had one wall in the back decorated with different scenes such as a fight, a charro on his horse, a bullfight, or a caricature of some historical figure. At some point along the wall, there was a shrine with an image of the Virgin Mary or a saint, a vase with roses and poppies and a candle. The bulke was stored in three or four large jars or bar barrels, three to five feet high, that stood five feet um, apart from the back wall. They had a wide bottom and a narrow top and were painted in loud colors with their names in big letters. Close to the barrels, there was a rustic shelf containing the clay cups. So this image is kind of accurate. Um, so the, the drink that was served, as you can see in the back right hand corner there, what in the barrel, was pulque, which is extracted in like this from the maguey plant and then uh, fermented um, 
and it has a similar nutritional value and alcohol contact, uh, content of maybe a classic Mexican beer. Um, of course, pulque is, is uh, a much more ancient tradition in Mexico than beer, which is only about 120 or so years old, 130 years old. Pulque has an ancient, highly spiritual and community building history going back um, thousands of years, uh, far long before Europeans came to Mexico. Uh, pulque cannot be preserved effectively, so it is almost always drunk right near where it is made. Uh, Mexico City hosted literally several, uh, several hundred pulquerias and uh, about 800 legal pulquerias. Uh, and remember, this is a city of around 130,000 people. Uh, so that's 800 of these. Um, and a number of what was called vineterias as well. And in vineterias, you sold, they sold uh, aguardiente, which is a uh, cane, uh, cane alcohol, alcohol, distilled alcohol made from sugar cane. So on the Spanish government, as you can see, this is kind of a satirical painting of a, um, a knight in a pulqueria, uh, harshly decried the effects of pulque on their imperial subjects. Um, but they made hundreds of thousands of pesos off an official government monopoly over the production and selling of the drink. So records from this monopoly indicate that on average, any given adult resident of Mexico City imbibed hundreds of gallons of pulque annually. So I got a couple images. Uh, this one's actually really cool because um, this pulqueria called El Recreo de Amigos it's one of the oldest ones and one of the longest lasting ones. And this looks like a late 19th century photograph. Um, you can see the diversity of the clientele of a pulqueria and that's really accurate for 100 years earlier too in the period that I'm talking about. Uh, evidence really shows that a lot of people, Spaniards, indigenous people, people of African descent, all hung out together at the pulqueria and hopefully had a good time. Um, you can see that decorated barrel and then I hate to say it, but the, the poke was also stored in those pig um, skins, a, a natural uh, storage container. Uh, let's see, okay, and here is a, a, another close-up of that map. And if you look at the bottom left, you can see the words Pulqueria del Palacio, and that is the entire street name. The street, the entire street is named after a particularly busy and famous Pulqueria. So it's a, Big business, very well known, represented on these official maps. Okay, so looking at the night watchmen. So like most uh, European and uh, American cities, um, up until the 19th century, Mexico City, just like a lot of other cities, had volunteer um, kind of unregulated uh, representatives of the judiciary who made their rounds at night and who responded to residents' requests for help or intervention in disputes. By the end of the 18th century, again, uh, similar to many other large cities, leaders began to fear a significant population increase um, because rural migrant, migrants were fleeing um, from the countryside due to droughts and famine, disease, trying to find a way to survive in the big city. So <clears throat> imitating their French and Spanish peers, uh, Mexico City's leaders created this new force of night watchmen. Um, in 1790. Here, I like this image. I know it's black and white and kind of simple. And actually, I think it's of Santiago de Chile, but it gives you a nice feeling of, of how these men worked. So they were um, paid a salary, which is um, kind of modern for law enforcement. Um, they received a few pesos more a month than a day laborer on a building site, which is a really common job for the poor. These men patrolled a few blocks of the city and here's a typical, um, what they called ramo, or patrol area, branch, literally in Spanish, um, from every night from sundown to sun up. Um, in almost all archival rec records, the night watchmen do not have names. They're anonymous, but they're given a number which refers to their patrol area, their beat. So this is the patrol area for watchman uh, number 86. Uh, their, present, uh, their presence on the street was supposed to help control um, a perceived threat of murder and robbery. Uh, we don't, there's no way to analyze statistically for any law enforcement in this era in any city if that helped in any way, shape, or form. Um, even if the crime was bad initially, there's no way to, but the, the perception was that crime was very bad and the city needed help. Um, everybody blamed, you know, the elite blamed rural migrants 
poor rural migrants to the city. Uh, what's interesting is there was actually, actually, I won't do that now. Um, there was a there was a horrific uh, murder spree in 1789, uh, a killing of 11 people just before the night watchmen were founded. Um, and this is uh, some weapon, a drawing of the weapons. Um, somebody found these thrown into a ditch not, not long after this murder spree that killed uh, 11 people in the house of a rich merchant called Joaquin Dongo. Um, which was him and a bunch of his household staff and business associates. So um, they found these knives and they did an investigation and actually the murderers were executed within one month of the murder. So very fast and harsh um, justice. So um, the night watchmen were uh, known by um, the term like guardas, guards. They were also called serenos. Uh, because what they, the reason they got that name is because they walked around saying the time and the weather. Um, so they yell at the time and then almost every single night in Mexico City is clear and mild. So they always yelled out Sereno, which means calm. So then their nickname became Serenos. So a focus of my book is to focus, uh, to look at these men as part of the working class who found themselves targeted uh, because the, the populace generally saw them as symbols of an imperial system that inspired aggression and rebellion from the average person. So I did my best with the surviving records to find, figure out who these men were and um, who, they, um, who they arrested and, and reactions to them. So um, here's, here's the type of records that we use for this. Uh, this is a, a leather bound book. Um, if you open it up, and this is in the um, uh, main National Archive in Mexico City. There's a couple of these books surviving. If you open it up, you see this. Uh, this is from 1795. Um, it's done by a particular notary. It's We usually call it the Libros de Reos, which means the Book of Arrested People. <clears throat> and um, here they list the arrests made night by night. Um, if you look at these, you can see a ton of information. And, and I analyzed um, 3,600 of these entries, which are very short, but um, I also had access to quite a few hundred pages of other uh, documented cases. So I got a lot of information. So if you look at these, like if you just look at the middle one on the left side, uh, it starts with the name of the person who's arrested. Um, in this case, it's Josefa Margarita Samudio and her label, which here is listed as Española, a Spanish woman, uh, a widow born in Mexico City, aged 30. And she was arrested. Um, you can, there's a, um, a guard number, looks like guard number 83, at 11.15 at night for drunk and um, causing a scandal. So drunk and disorderly, basically. Um, she denied it, but when she was taken to jail, the jail, uh, I guess we would say deputy, um, said she was drunk. And so she received a sentence of eight days in jail. <clears throat> then below, we have a man labeled uh, Mestizo, pretty much the same offense. And he got eight days public works, ocho dias de obras publicas. So for a man, they were sentenced to convict labor. Then if you look to the other side, the second entry down, um, you see Rafael Montero, Espanol de Mexico. So a man called Rafael Montero, a Spaniard uh, born in Mexico, uh, a blacksmith. Um, uh, a married man, age 57, and uh, also drunk uh, and passed out in an alleyway. And for punishment, he had eight days in jail and three days in a dungeon called the Bartolina. Um, the next guy, actually, this is a really good page. Um, same thing, drunk, passed out on a particular street, and he actually had eight days in the stocks. That's ocho dias de calzada. So these are the typical punishments pretty much summed up well there in one page in one page and you can see similar things as I said thousands and thousands of these uh, fortunately survive for different days. Um, another thing that um, the Night Watchmen did was a little bit of social welfare. So here you see a very interesting um, example of one of my most intriguing ones to me. Um, I'll just read it to you. Jose Caetano Espejo Español de México, soltero sin oficio de 12 años. So this is a, a, a boy of Spanish ancestry, born in Mexico, 12 years old. And then the next, number two, Tomás Joaquín Español de México, sin oficio como de dos años. So a two-year-old boy, he does not have a job, <laughs> and he's of Spanish ancestry. So one of the corporals found um, these two boys at 11 p.m., 
sleeping in a trash heap. They were, at the bottom it says they are orphans who fled where they're working. And then on the right, top right, bonga oficio, they are put into a job. So this is a little bit of the social welfare that, um, that you know, kind of first responder type activity that these um, men did. So uh, let's see. Now you might assume that these men were typically young. The night watchmen were typically young um, because they, it's a physical job. Um, they walked up and down the streets. They climbed ladders to light the lanterns. They arrested people. Um, they were, the, the documents say that they were um, between age 19 and 61, which is quite hard to believe in this era. Um, and most of them were in their 20s. Um, so the job valued strength and endurance more than uh, life experience. <clears throat> they were typically uh, born in Mexico City. Uh, half of them were born in Mexico City. Um, oh, I'm sorry, over half were born in Mexico City. Um, and uh, which is not all that different than the people they arrested. Um, so actually two of the guards came from an incredible distance to do this job. Um, one, uh, in an investigation of a fight that occurred in 1797 between a group of the Serenos and an infantry sergeant, witnesses included a guard named Antonio Rey, who is a 40 year old man from Santiago in Galicia, Spain. And even more interesting, a 38 year old man called Antonio de Jesus Magalón, who was born in Manila in the Philippines. Um, so the other thing I looked at was um, race labels for the night watchmen. Um, most of them were claiming Spanish as their official uh, designation. Um, uh, and, and I'm using the words in these records, which refer to imperialist ideas of lineage and place of origin, not, not a modern idea of race. It's really important to realize that, that one cannot equate the labels used in the records like this um, to an identity that we recognize now or some kind of particular genetic makeup. That's not how they were viewed in that time. Uh, there was an idea of calidad or quality, which is a more general sense of um, status which includes where you were born, what language you speak, uh, appearance, but that's not the only factor. Um, so 62% of the night watchmen said they were Espanoles. That means uh, basically in our terms, white Europeans. Uh, that's more, more Espanoles than in the general population of the city. The next label, which probably a lot of people have heard of, is uh, Mestizo. Um, and that kind of kind of the same number of people labeled mestizo as in the census. Then there were a handful of people who um, worked as night watchmen, and this is really interesting. I think when you think about U.S. history, um, they had res racial designations that suggest African ancestry, and these are in the uh, terminology of the time, castizo or mulatto. So um, there weren't all that many people who called themselves labels of African descent in the census. So it's kind of similar to what's reflected in these night watchmen. So I, I just think it's really interesting. I see a lot of things on social media about the first black policemen in the Americas and whatnot. And I, I really think that these men are, are the first ones, not um, some other arguments that I've had on social media lately about it. <laughs> Uh, and also really fascinating is um, there are a few guards who have the race label Indio, which of course is an imperialist word in this era referring to descendants of indigenous peoples. Um, so a couple of the guards were labeled Indio, although um, at least one quarter of the population of the city in the census had this label. Uh, in, in Spanish America, for, for 300 years at this time, um, indigenous people were forbidden from carrying weapons such as swords. They had to apply um, as, as no, men of noble descent, indigenous but noble descent, uh, in order to get permission to carry a sword. Um, so it's pretty interesting that, they, that men labeled Indios were working as um, armed guards. Um, it's, it's also kind of interesting because um, you could argue that this force was policing indigenous drinking culture. So it's sort of interesting to think that, that there were men labeled Indios who were policing people also labeled Indios. Um, but what's also very interesting is that race label, there's quite a lot of um, 
rejection and, and, and insulting going on to the guards, but I've never seen any that included race labels. So their occupation itself inspired enough violence and conflict in the general populace. People didn't need to call on racial slurs to, um, uh, you know, uh, try to insult the guards. So basically what these men in this very, very early law, law enforcement, uh, professional law enforcement group in the Americas, basically they were illiterate men, virtually none of them could sign their names. Most of them had European and ancestry. They were mostly in their 20s. They were mostly married and born in Mexico City. So um, other than the uh, policing of drinking, um, the, one of the main uh, tasks that these men did, as you can see in this image, which looks like it's from 1860s or so, uh, it's part of their name, the Lantern Guards or the Guardafaroleros. They lit, lighted and maintained about 12 lanterns in their patrol areas each night. Um, so what was the inspiration for doing this? Um, in the words of the city government, uh, illumin so this is a quote, might not be from this exact document, but from a similar document. Uh, and sometimes I get lucky and there's printed documents. Um, illumination is very useful because darkness engenders enormous crimes, not only because it covers them, but because it encourages criminals to commit them. For this reason, public lighting has been adopted in Europe in the most organized city. This capital has even more justification to follow this example because its population is undoubtedly very numerous and very corrupt. So that, that's the perception of why, why street patrols were needed. Uh, motivated by these worries, for about 30 years, leaders in Mexico City tried to figure out ways to organize public street lighting. And after a many, many thousands of words uh, explaining their trial and error, they concluded that it was absolutely impossible to mandate residents um, private, you know, in front of their private houses to install, ignite, and maintain uh, lanterns like the one shown here. Um, this is an image of a lantern from 1777, a street lantern that was considered, you know, an ideal one to emulate. Um, you can see very beautifully decorated um, and ornate, expensive. Um, so after all these efforts to try to make people to light their large, uh, you know, the walls in front of their large houses to, to light the entire street, a well-known reforming viceroy um, uh, <clears throat> um, known as the Count of Reviajedo, he set up a system whereby a small tax on all the flour that entered the city would pay for the purchase of well over 1,000 lanterns and other equipment to install them and pay for the salaries of the new Corps of Lantern Guards, which was about 110 people total, and the ongoing purchase of oil for the lantern. Um, the oil used in these lanterns was actually turnip oil, which is totally absurd when I learned that. Um, but even more surprising, perhaps, is in lanterns like this in Italy, they used olive oil, uh, cheap olive oil, not the best olive oil. In other places like Portugal, they used sardine oil. And of course, sadly, uh, a lot of places used whale oil. Um, so maybe turnip oil isn't so weird. So um, the viceroy uh, justified his reform similar to what the thinking had been all along. He said, uh, street lighting would restore the tranquility that decent men lacked. It will contain the habitual or careless delinquent, preventing evil deeds from coming to pass. It will provide the inestimable comfort of street transit without danger. This very populous capital with a growing number of all kinds of residents cannot rest without establishing the good order of governance, and in Spanish, that is el buen orden de policía. So that word policía had a much broader meaning. Uh, and the viceroy went on, and lighting is a fundamental, um, lighting is fundamental to everything as it strikes at the root of the worst crimes planned by day and executed at night. So this is uh, an image um, of, um, you know, representing this particular viceroy, um, Juan Vicente de Güemes Pacheco de Padilla, or the Count of Revilla Gijedo. And this is, was on, um, in his palace on a fountain, there was a plaque that said that he established public lighting in the city of Mexico in 1790 and the Lantern Guards. <clears throat> so um, now I like this image. These are actually, both of these are from Spain, um, but I think they're very evocative to present the, um, working life of a uh, night watchman in Mexico City and um, just know he had a he always carried a hand lantern which he used to light the street lights 
Uh, the weapon that you see uh, might be translated in, into English as a pike. It was called a chuso. And uh, obviously you wore a big cloak uh, for standing around all night long. So um, Mexico City, uh, the Lantern Guards uh, did not wear uh, uniforms. Their weapons were ineffective and they avoided using them because they personally had to pay the medical bills of anybody that they injured with that weapon called the chuso. Um, so a lot of men in the general population went out carrying swords, as I said before, daggers, other knives. So, so people were pretty well armed in Mexico City at this time. It didn't seem like they had a major problem with these men carrying these chuzos. What the population really hated was the lanterns. Um, surviving documents are very incomplete, but they record at least 75 incidents of residents smashing the night watchman's lanterns uh, just when they encountered the night watchman, they fought with him, or when they were being um, taken into custody. Uh, people tore their clothes uh, of the night watchman, they threw their hats away, you know, into a ditch, they broke their weapons, but nothing as popular as smashing their lanterns. Uh, so I have an image, it's kind of a not a great image, but it's the best I could find of lantern smashing in Europe, so you can get a sense of, uh, you know, how people felt. <laughs> Um, so Mexico City did not experience any street battles or major riots uh, during the mass insurgency movement of the early 19th century that led to independence from Spain. But my argument in this book is that lantern smashing was an act, a small act of political rebellion, which is what European historians uh, argue for France, uh, England, etc. In 19th century Europe, uh, commentators compared the street lanterns to a red flag waved in a bull's face because they sparked a vicious and destructive rage in the populace. Um, there's that shocking sound of shattering glass that rang through the streets. Um, it's an idea of, of brutally rejecting the state and bringing back disorder and freedom on the streets. Um, every attack on a street lantern is a small act of rebellion against the state that it represented. Uh, lantern smashing darkened the streets, extinguishing these isolated beacons of, of the Enlightenment, um, turning back the clock to an era of less official surveillance um, of the nightly doings that had been considered criminal under, under this regime. Uh, and an instantly darkened street invited more rebellious and unlawful acts. So I tried to analyze who um, did all the lantern smashing. Uh, because that would indicate who hated the lantern guards and therefore who who hated the this uh, regime and I'm going to go over this really quickly because I, I want to have plenty of time for questions, but every every race label uh, smashed lanterns men women couples groups uh, enjoyed smashing lanterns, um, but the majority of the incidents were done by people with the race label Indio, so people of indigenous descent. So they, that basically this is a way to have a small scale rebellion. Um, you could say that, wow, 75 lanterns on record being smashed isn't that much, but if you think of this city as being only about 130,000 people at most, um, that's a lot of destruction. And this is of course their most expensive piece of equipment. So um, I'm going to skim over this to get to the end pretty quickly, but um, this is just some of the, the group attacks that I recorded. So there were a lot of individual uh, lantern smashing incidents too, but here's just a couple of uh, ones that involved groups. And you can see uh, very diverse groups of people hung out together at night drinking, men, women of different labels from the era. Um, so it kind of gives you a sense of, of what was going on at night as well and the guards that they attacked. All right, and if you want me to go back to that and question answer, I'd be happy to, but I wanna close things off pretty soon. Um, all right, so Mexico City did, did experience um, nonviolent political change. This is a kind of a silly image of a coup d'etat which forced out the Viceroy in 1808. Then of course, we have the mass insurgency movement that was not in Mexico City, but a few hundred miles to the west, um, which is led by the priest uh, Miguel Hidalgo, starting in September of 1810. So we just did the 210th anniversary of that. Um, and that's, of course, a mass insurgency movement, right? Tens of thousands of people joining. 
mainly the poor, right? About 18 months later, um, in Spain, there was a new constitution and that called the first ever opportunity for broad-based elections in Spanish territories in the new world. Mexico City elected representatives for their city leadership for the first time, broad-based election. According to observers, this election was very well organized and run out of the parish churches, of course, classically from the time period. All adult, now I think this is really important, um, all adult men, regardless of race label or property ownership, could vote. And the leaders um, who won were on the side of independence from Spain. This is as of 1812, unanimously. So this city favored insurgency, even though it didn't have major street rioting. Um, so my theory is that the revolutionary populace, because the populace was revolutionary, according to this election, um, they tar instead of rioting full out, um, they targeted the Lantern Guards as representatives of the imperial state that they wished to overthrow. So I don't want to go into too many details, but um, the mass insurgency movement led by Hidalgo and Morelos and others did not exactly succeed in the way that its followers hoped, but ultimately New Spain um, gained its independence via a coalition of rebel and royalist generals kind of represented here. Um, and their coalition was united to focus on protecting the rights of the military and the Catholic Church as well as uh, getting rid of the last Spanish vice, right? It should come as no great surprise that the previous law enforcement system survived on the street level after independence, but actually with an increase in robberies and violence due to the militarization of this city um, in the form of soldiers who frequently started fights with the guards and threatened residents. Um, so there were a lot of robberies and violence in the 1820s in Mexico City um, between the military and um, law enforcement. So few historians or people who understand um, 19th century Mexico would argue that the legal system saw improvements over what colonial subjects experienced under Spanish rule. <clears throat> um, as I said at the beginning, how issues around race and law enforcement can contribute to revolution are some of the emphases of my book. While historically in a very different time and place, I think a study of Mexico City can help situate some of our current debates. And I'd love to hear anyone's thoughts and questions on this topic. So thank you for listening. And I hope we've got some things to discuss with the group more broadly for the next 10, 20 minutes. All right, thanks so much. That's the end of what I have to say. <laughs>